Scotland and England, joined yet separate, friends and yet foes. Or maybe just really awkward siblings. I've been taking a trip along the Scotland-England border in the trusty camper van lent to me by Perthshire Camper Hire. But today, I'm going to abandon our four-wheeled steed and take you on two legs and then two pedals to show you some of the things that unite and divide us as we travel along St Cuthbert's Way. So, if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. We start at Melrose Abbey. It's a beautiful day in the borders. I've got scenery to show and stories to tell. It's just that there's so much that I hardly know where to start. Actually, that's not true. I already told you that we're starting at Melrose Abbey in Scotland and we're going to finish at the Abbey of Lindisfarne in England. But the guy who's the reason for the journey lived before either of the two of them existed, at a time when this was Northumbria. I'm going to start St Cuthbert's Way on foot and end it by bicycle. And along the way we'll see both sides of the love-hate relationship between these two neighbours. Melrose Abbey is a place to start, not because it's where the heart of Scotland's most famous protector and warrior King Robert the Bruce is buried, but because it's where the career of a cross-border monk was born. So who is this guy, St Cuthbert? You might not realise it, but if you've watched the Netflix show The Last Kingdom, then you already have come across St Cuthbert. What's he got to do with Melrose, you might ask? Let's make a start on the St Cuthbert Way and I'll tell you all about it. Cuthbert was born in Dunbar in the mid-630s AD. Now, I'd say that he was of noble birth, but like a lot of what we're going to see in this journey, there are two views. In his early days, he seems to have been instructed in arms. Now that sounds like high birth. There's talk of him being related to King Aldfrith of Northumbria. Woo! that sounds a bit posh and he was fostered. Now in those days, that too was a sign of noble birth. He was actually fostered and brought up here in Melrose. In the story, the reason that Cuthbert transferred the monastic life was because one night he was tending his sheep and he had a vision of the soul of Aidan, the Bishop of Lindisfarne, being carried off to heaven by angels. It later turned out that the vision took place at exactly the time that Aidan had died miles away. Now, you might think that sounds a bit far-fetched. And you'd be right. High-born people didn't look after sheep. If it had been cattle, the story would have been much more believable. The point is that there's some evidence of both high and ignoble birth. Now, given his later ascetic life, kindness and humility to the poor, connecting him with sheep, might just have been a way to make a high-born man seem more in touch with the people. Every prospective saint needs a good PR team, don't they? He started monastic service in Melrose, but when the prior died in mid-1660s AD, Cuthbert was made prior in his place. He spent a lot of time among the people, looking after their needs, preaching, performing miracles and undertaking missionary journeys from berwick upon tweed in the east to Galloway in the west. He did a bit of north and south as well, but these were very different times. The Melrose Abbey that we see was first built by David I of Scotland when he invited Cistercian monks to come here. When Cuthbert was alive, there was no such thing as Scotland, or England for that matter. England being the slightly younger country. This was all the kingdom of Northumbria. Now, obviously, there was a bit of fighting back and forth between Northumbria and other neighbours, and power struggles within Northumbria as well. They suffered from an age-old problem. Humans. It turns out humans were capable of violence even before Scotland and England existed. It was about the only thing that the Scots didn't invent but we're still pretty good at it. People battled across a different border. It was a bit more vague, somewhere around the River Forth where it separated Pictland from Northumbria. It was kings warring back and forth 
back and forth across that estuary that gave it its name. It's a little known fact you could bring up next time you're in a pub discussion. Now, don't feel the need to credit me. You're welcome. In fact, let's just keep my name out of it altogether. Whilst kings fought each other, Cuthbert fought a different battle. He was born in the 630s, not long after King Edwin of Northumbria had converted to Christianity. Check out my video, The Scottish English Saint of Lindisfarne. Whilst the temporal world fought its wars, Cuthbert fought a spiritual struggle between pagan and Christian beliefs. He was also in the middle of the tension between the Celtic and the Roman Church until the Synod of Whitby finally decided on an agreed date to start selling cream eggs. 330 years after Cuthbert was dead, there was a battle there in 1018. It was between the people of Alaba, now Scotland, and the people of Northumbria. And whose banner did the people of Northumbria carry before them but St Cuthbert? As it was, he didn't protect the Northumbrians that day. And effectively, that's when the place down that hill we call Melrose, the place St Cuthbert started his ministry, ceased to be Northumbria and became Scotland. I've never stood here before, but I've often stood over there at Walter Scott's viewpoint and looked in this direction. He's one of those characters who was a great supporter of the union between the two countries north and south of that border. And yet, he was strongly in favour of maintaining the culture and heritage of Scotland. It's all downhill from there. We're taking a long downhill slope towards the end of this section at St Boswell's. Just after St Boswell's, St Cuthbert's Way will take you along an old Roman road. Which reminds us that before Scotland or England were ever thought of, before the Kingdom of Northumbria, was a glint in the eye of an Anglo-Saxon invader. The political map was different again. The Roman Emperor Hadrian had a very different idea about where that border should be and what it would mean. But that's a story for another video in this series. The point is that as you walk the path of St Cuthbert, this landscape feels more like wallpaper in an old house where each layer peeled off reveals a new layer underneath, unearthing the styles and prevailing political patterns of that era. It's almost as if you could steam off the patterns of today's fields to see Walter Scott's borders. Another layer would reveal the reavers. The Northumbrian layer would peel back to show you the Angles who'd replaced the Britons before them. I wonder what patterns will be painted in the future. Now, it wasn't just the political landscape that had changed. St Cuthbert went through some changes as well. And so have I. Now, you might want to walk the whole of St Cuthbert's way sometime, but I'm a bit strapped for time. So I'm going to cycle the last two stages. And I'll tell you what happened next. Now, I can either use my push bike, for which I've bought all the gear, or, I can use the sexy electric bike lent to me by Dell at Bikes and Moors in Perth, who for some reason was too shy to be in a video shouting out his very own business. What's that about? After 15 years of being prior at Melrose, after all the travelling, all the caring for people, all the exhausting miracle working, Cuthbert was moved to take up the life of contemplation and solitude. I guess he'd seen enough seven aside rugby. The point is that after 15 years, he'd had enough of people. To be honest, I was like that after three months of COVID lockdown. But 15 years. I don't know about you, but I think I'd want to go and live in a cave. After a while, it turned out that the cave wasn't lonely enough. So he went to live on an island off the coast by Bamborough Castle. So, you're living life as a hermit on the island in the North Sea. You say you don't want any visitors, but folk keep coming, rowing out to ask for a blessing. Eventually, you open your window to give them a blessing and then shut it again. But before you know it, 
Here's the daughter of the king, the royal virgin and the holy abbess of St Hilda coming round to visit. Ah, oh, you've got to get out the goods tea set. When will a hermit get some peace around here? And then the final straw. They elect you Bishop of Hexham. And King Egfrith is at the door insisting that you take the job and in the name of the wee man, how many place settings am I going to need for this crockery set? As it was, he managed to get a swap with a bishop called Iata, who took the job at Hexham, and Cuthbert went to Lindisfarne. That was 684. He was consecrated at York in March 685, but within a year, he was back on his island, where he died on the 20th of March 686. That's when he got a new lease of life. Apparently, they opened his coffin 11 years after he died, which seems a wee bit creepy to me, but they found that his body hadn't decayed. The level of veneration rocketed. A hundred years later, when the Vikings arrived here, he was still the talk of Lindisfarne. Another hundred years, and the Danes took over Lindisfarne completely, and that's when you would have seen St Cuthbert in the TV show, The Last Kingdom. In series two, you would have seen the monks who'd fled Lindisfarne carrying Cuthbert's body around with them in a coffin. They carted it from place to place all around the region as they went, including back to Melrose at one point. As the Danes were adding a new layer of decoration to the countryside, St Cuthbert was getting another makeover to embellish his cult. He became the most popular saint in England, but I think there's a pretty good temporal reason for that. Apparently, Alfred the Great, King of Wessex, was inspired and encouraged in his struggle against the Danes because of a vision that he had of Cuthbert. Now, after that, the royal house of Wessex, who became the kings of not just Wessex, but a new thing called England, made a point of pious devotion to Cuthbert. Now, call me a cynic, but if I was a southern king looking to bring northern territories under my control to create a new vision of England, then I might be grateful for a bogeyman like the Danes, and I might be inclined to take on a northern saint as my special friend. Wouldn't you? In the years to follow, the fields were repainted again until we're getting closer to what we recognise as the border today. Now, don't get me wrong. Now that we had the two countries of Scotland where I started and England where I am now, there were loads more battles to come. And in those battles, English troops would march to war against the Scots under the banner of St Cuthbert, the man from Dunbar who grew up in Melrose. It turns out that there's no patron saint for irony. So they kept this up all the way to the Reformation. After which, the whole idea of saints providing insurance services kind of fell out of fashion anyway. But up until then, English folks might claim a great victory in battle was because St Cuthbert had granted it. Cuthbert refusing to back Northumbrians against advancing Scots back at the Battle of Carrum, that had all been forgotten. I still meet some English people who feel that they are superior. Now, I don't know if this is because they think St Cuthbert's on their side, but in the 21st century, he's always going to be trumped by Sean Connery watching over us. If you fancy some more history travels in the Scottish-English border, then there's another video coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I'm in Dawkins, can be a lamb of my life. Cheerio and Rasta.